is Christianity too narrow? I was dating my wife, D. She wasn't my wife at the time, but we were dating. And I decided that she was visiting where I grew up, which was Spain. And I decided that I would take her through the test, the real test, to see if she would pass it. There were some caves not too far away from where I grew up that as a boy I used to go down to these caves and crawl through these little tunnels and drag myself through the mud and with the flashlight. And I loved those caves. And I knew Dee was a city girl. So I thought, I'm going to take her to the caves. See if she is willing to drag herself through the mud for love. <laughs> now, there was one big, huge, cavernous gallery full of stalagmites and stalactites that I wanted to show her. The problem was that to get to this huge, cavernous, beautiful gallery inside of this cave, there was a long, narrow tunnel that you had to drag yourself through for probably about 20 feet. And so I told her, follow me, D." And so she said, sure. Her eyes full of love, glimmering with. And so she started to follow me. And I said, it's OK. She said, how hard is this? I said, it's going to be a little hard, but not that hard. And so we uh, crawled through this for about five feet. And then it got narrower and crawled through for about 20 feet. Now we were dragging, I'm dragging myself, she's behind me, there's a couple other people with us dragging, and all of a sudden I hear behind me, how far is this? How far? I said, she said to me, what if this caves in? I said, no, no, hold on, I don't think it's going to cave in. And she was crawling behind me, and the longer she crawled, the more panicky I heard her getting. A little bit more, how long, how dark is this? this I'm going to get stuck, what if I get stuck, who's going to pull me out? And finally, 20 feet later, muddy, crawling, dragging herself, she stepped into this huge cavernous cave that I was able to show her. And I said to her, I said to her, you know what? It's narrow to get there, but once you get there, boy, is it worth it. Now, later I said, hey, you know, I, that, you impressed me about how adventurous you were. She said, I was just doing that because I was dating you. I wouldn't do it again. You know, I thought about that story, and I thought, you know, Christianity's like that as well. Some people think it's way too narrow. And I believe that Christianity is narrow. But you have to go to th through something extremely narrow to get to something that's extremely great. You can't end up in the great unless you go through the narrow. And so I want to talk to you about, is Christianity too narrow and answer a couple of objections or questions that I get from people when I try to share the good news with them. Have you ever heard this question? I don't believe in absolute truth or this objection. I don't believe in absolute truth. Each of us needs to discover our own truth for ourselves. Anybody ever hear that? Or how about you have your truth, I have my truth, your truth is good for you. My truth is good for me. We're all discovering our truth. What about this objection? All religions have a piece of truth, but none of them have all the truth. So you're a Christian and you have some truth, but the Hindus have some truth. Islam has some truth. Buddhism has some truth. And so to say that you have all the truth, man, that is prideful. So we all have a little truth, but no one has all the truth. Anybody hear that before? What about this objection? Faith should be private. Religion and belief about faith should be private. You can believe what you want, but don't try to convince me of what you believe because we all have our own private belief that's good. Ever hear that objection? So we live in a world today in which there's a lot of people that believe Christianity's too narrow. It's way too narrow, way too exclusive, way too strict in its view and not open enough. And I believe today 
that we need to identify and we need to understand, is Christianity too narrow? And to do so, I want you to take your Bibles and look at the first passage I want to show you, found in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 14, in which Jesus himself tells us whether Christianity is too narrow. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. I believe, based on what I see in Scripture, that Christianity is radically narrow. Listen to what Jesus says. Enter through the, hold on, say it out loud. Enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life. And only few people find it. Words of Jesus. If you're asking, is Christianity too narrow? Let me say, the founder of Christianity, Jesus Christ himself, Jesus the Messiah, the one who died, the living word, he looks at Christianity, he talks about Christianity, and the road to God, and he says, he says this, enter through the narrow gate. If Jesus calls it narrow, then I want to tell you, Christianity is very narrow. Now, I want, to t- I want to call, make sure that you understand the difference. I believe that Christianity is narrow enough to lead to life, yet it's broad enough to lead to grace. Truth is narrow, but grace is wide. Write that down. Truth is narrow, but grace is wide. Can I tell you that one of the big values in our society today One of the big things that our culture talks about today is a word that we would call pluralism. Pluralism is the belief that there are more than one reality that should be accepted. That there are multiple realities that are equally important and that should be accepted. Pluralism believes that you could believe in Christianity, someone else could believe in Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam, or new age, and that all of those in our society are equally valid and important, and pluralism says there are multiple equally valued realities, and there is not one that's right. All of them are equally right, and so they should be accepted, celebrated, and um, viewed in the same light, and if one person feels like their view is above other people's views, then they're bigoted and biased and should be rejected. How many of you know what I'm talking about here? That is the cultural accepted idea. That, that is what is valued in our culture today. It's called pluralism. I want to tell you that Christianity has been considered a narrow religion Not just in today's society, but for the last 2,000 years when it was started. In fact, do you realize, and you may know this already, but do you know that in the first century, shortly after Jesus was crucified, died, and rose again, that the early church started spreading Christianity throughout what was called the Roman Empire. Now, the Romans had conquered the world, and for about 900 years, the Romans ruled the world. They conquered all the way from Italy down into Africa through most of Europe into um, Asia and included Israel and all of that area around there. In fact, during the days of Jesus, uh, Jerusalem was an outpost of the Roman Empire. And that you remember that it was Pilate that had to approve the death of Jesus, even though it was the It was the Pharisees that asked for the death of Jesus. It had to be approved by a Roman because it was the Roman that oversaw the the, uh, Jewish outpost. So in the Roman culture, there were multiplicity of gods. There were hundreds of gods that the Romans embraced. There was the God of war and the God of fertility. There was the God of the heavens and the God of the waters. There was the God of vengeance. And there was a God of uh, fruitful and harvest and yield. And there were hundreds of gods. And so when you were a part of the Roman Empire, uh, you would say, I have five favorite gods that I follow and worship. And, and you would offer sacrifice to those gods. And among those gods, 
the emperor was considered a god himself. And so every year all the Romans would have to come and they, they would have to pay their venerance to the God, the emperor, and they would celebrate and sacrifice to him as though he were a God. And so gods were tolerated. There wasn't one God in Rome. There were hundreds of gods that people would, uh, would uh, subscribe to and embrace. But Christians presented a problem because no one cared that Christians embraced Christ because they embraced hundreds of gods, but they persecuted Christians. It was the Christians that were fed to the lions, the Christians that were crucified, the Christians that were sought after, the Christians that were considered uh, traitors to the Roman Empire. And the question is, why was it Christians when people followed so many gods? Let me tell you why Christians were persecuted uh, Christians were sought after, why the Christians had to meet in the catacombs. How many of you have heard of the catacombs? The catacombs were the sewer system under Rome that Christians would meet in because they couldn't be seen meeting publicly because they would be jailed, persecuted, and uh, um, thrown oftentimes uh, crucified, thrown to the lions. What was it about Christians that was so hated by the Roman government? It was one thing, one thing that the Romans didn't like about Christians. Christians were too narrow. Christians said there is one God, one way to God. Jesus is the way to God. We believe that there is one God and one way to God. And although there are many gods out there that people embrace, we believe that there's only one way to God. We believe that Jesus Christ is the way to get right with the Father. We will worship and bow down to no other gods, not even the emperor, because we believe that that's, that's a violation of what we believe. There is one God that we will choose. And so they were viewed as intolerant, as bigoted, as traitors to the government, not because they worship Christ, but because they exclusively worshiped Christ. Are you tracking with me here? This is important to understand because the Roman Empire, the same thing that happened in the Roman Empire in those days, is the culture somewhat that now exists in this day. Most people don't care if you worship Christ. They don't it's not an issue that you worship Christ. They're not going to come against you if you worship Christ. But what bothers them, what really irritates people, is if you believe that Christ is the way, the only way, the best way, the way to God, higher than other forms and areas, then they believe, then it becomes something that irritates them because you're exclusive about your Christianity. And so I want to talk about that a little bit, and I'm going to ask ourselves, is Christianity too narrow? If we look at Scripture, I want you to see what Jesus said about himself. In John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one, who? No one comes to the Father except through me. What was Jesus saying? Jesus was declaring that he is the way to God, he is the truth, and he is the life, and that there is absolutely not multiple ways to be right with God. There is only one way to be right with God, and Jesus Christ provides that way. There's not plan A, plan B, plan C. There's not option A, B, or C. There's not multiple ways to God. Jesus was exclusive. He declares very clearly, I am the only way to God, and that became a stumbling block to the early church. The Greeks hated it. The Jews resented it. Other religions were against it because they understood the exclusive nature of Christianity. It seemed to be extremely narrow to declare that there's only one way to God. And we continue to look at Scripture, and we continue to see, and by the way, I want to make a difference between, I want to make sure that we understand the difference between being narrow-minded and having a narrow way. 
Having a narrow way means that there is a very concrete, specific way. Being narrow-minded means that you typically are shut down and very against anybody having any opinion that's different than yours. Narrow-mindedness is an attitude. Narrow way is a position. And I want you to understand the difference. I want you to see um, that Jesus, over and over, when he talks about himself... He goes contrary to our pluralistic society. Let me explain it this way. If you believe, many people in our society today believe, by the way, including, hello, millennial Christians. How many of you, how many millennials do we have in the house today? Raise your hand. Wave at me. Come on. The next generation. Let me tell you, um, a, a recent survey discovered that the majority of millennial Christians in today's society believe that the majority of millennials that are attending Christian churches believe that there are more than one way to get to God. In fact, they discovered that actually over half of millennials that go to Christian churches, they feel and believe that it's wrong to evangelize. In other words... The idea is, if I'm a Christian, to go to someone that's not a Christian and try to convince them that Jesus is the way and that they should leave their religion or, or, or beliefs to follow Christ, to them they feel like, no, that's wrong. That's offensive. I'm talking about millennial Christians. I'm talking about Christians in the church that are in the ages of 20, early 30s, they believe that to try to convince someone that Jesus is the way when they're on another path, that that is wrong to do. Why would we believe that? We would only believe that if we are convinced that there's multiple ways to God. And some people, and by the way, our culture has taught us, if you've been raised in today's educational system, if you've gone to the public school, if you've gone to college, you have been saturated with this concept. All religions are good in one way or another. All religions are the same in essence. As long as people are sincere, and as long as people try not to do bad to others, as long as they pray to whatever form of God they choose to pray to, and as long as they try to do good in whatever religion they do, then ultimately we all end up worshiping the same God in the same place, in the same way, even though we may call him by different names. How many of you have heard that? Let me, let me talk about that for a second because that is the, that's the general philosophy that I hear today, especially among millennials, and some people have described it this way. Um, I think it's a Hindu proverb that says, hey, if you take... Uh, ten blind people and take them to an elephant and all the blind people start touching that elephant, someone may touch the tail and think it, look, it, it looks like a snake. Someone may touch the leg and think it looks like a tree trunk. Someone else may touch the, the um, trunk and thinks that it looks like a hose. And so they're all describing the same thing but in different ways and they apply it to religion and say, you know, some people think that religion is this way, some people really, but ultimately we're all talking about the same thing and so ultimately we're all on the same path going to the same place. And so therefore, if I believe that you have a religion that's as good as mine, if I believe that your religion leads you the same place as Christianity, then of course it would be wrong to try to proselytize you or convince you that's wrong because I would be disrespecting your heritage because ultimately we all end up in the same place. You may have embraced that mentality. You may be here to say, Pastor Mark, that makes sense to me. I'm a Christian. I choose to believe the Bible and follow Christ. But I think there's a lot of other religions out there that we all end up in God in one big happy family swaying back and forth singing Kumbaya together. Let me just say this. Let me, hear me well. 
You cannot be a follower of Jesus according to Scripture, according to the Bible. You cannot be an orthodox, authentic follower of Jesus the Christ and embrace his message if you embrace embrace the wrong theology that there are other multiple ways to God. They are mutually exclusive. You say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, Jesus says there is no other way to the Father but by me. So either you have to embrace Jesus or deny Jesus, but you can't call yourself a Christian and embrace that there are multiple ways to God. They are contradictory to each other. There is no, I embrace multiple ways to God, but yet I'm a believer because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said, uh, the Bible says, there's one mediator between God and man, and that is Jesus Christ, the righteous one. Jesus Christ declared that he is the exclusive only way to God, so there is no way to accept multiple ways to God if you are a true follower of Jesus. Now, that causes a stumbling block to many. Man, it's quiet in this place, and I like it. I'm talking about, is Christianity too narrow? I'm talking about, I was on Lakeshore Drive the other day, trying to get downtown. And I was, as I was driving down Lakeshore Drive, it was, it was a really bad, stormy, icy day. And I noticed that there was three squad cars that were blocking Lakeshore Drive. And I thought, great, I'm going to be late. And they rerouted me off an exit, and I had to go under and go through downtown to get to where I was going. And later, as I read the paper, I discovered that there were some, there were some beams on Lakeshore Drive that had broken or, or gotten misaligned. And so if you drove on Lakeshore Drive, you would actually fall a couple of feet or even fall to your death. It was very dangerous. Now... The policemen that were guarding Lakeshore Drive were saying, this is the wrong way. Do not go here. There's destruction. I didn't get off the road and say, they are so narrow-minded and biased and bigoted. Why in the world did they not let me go down Lakeshore Drive? I can't believe how narrow-minded they are. I can't believe how close-minded they are because always... Always, all roads are good if they just let me go down. No, the truth is that if I had gone down that road without police blocking it off, I would have gone to my death. The truth is that that was a road that led, that led to death. It was a dangerous road. And so if I believe that there is a reality, a right way and a wrong way, we have to determine is there a right way? Is there a wrong way? I can't embrace Jesus Christ as a way, but not the way if I embrace biblical Christianity. Come on, is someone with me, with me today? Let me present it another way. If you had been bitten by a poisonous snake, and yet we discovered that there was an anti-venom that you could be given. And you went to the doctors and you said, I've been bitten by a poisonous snake. I only have so long to live. And the doctor said, I have a venom, an anti-venom, that if you take this venom can keep you alive. And so I'm going to give you this medicine so that you don't die. And you say, well, aren't you being narrow-minded though? Because I think there's multiple options here, right? And the doctor says, no, there's one option that will save you. Yeah, but, but it feels narrow to me. It feels a little biased or exclusive. It feels like you're, you're not giving other options the possibility. Like, what if I take some aspirin or, 
What if I take a Ambien? I really like Ambien, and you know, I've taken it in the past. And what if I take some Ambien? And, and the doctor says, no, you can take those, but there's only one venom. There's only one anti-venom that's going to that's gonna help you. And you say, well, you know, I don't believe in this because I believe in pluralism. I believe that all are equal. And so in my reality, in my reality, I want to take aspirin because I don't want to be exclusive. Now, you can take aspirin. Let me tell you this. You're going to die. Because no, you, you, there is a truth and there is a false. In your mind, you may think something is true, but it could be false. Just because you're sincere about something doesn't mean it's right. There's a truth and there's a false. And so, therefore, we have to discover what is true and what is false. And we can't just make up reality in our mind and have contradictory elements. Let me tell you one other thing. Jesus, it tells us in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, it says this. Listen, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which you must be saved. What does the Bible say? Salvation is found in what? No one else. Is that exclusive? Is that narrow? Yes. The point that I'm making when people say is Christianity narrow, I have to say Christianity is extremely narrow. Jesus himself said, there's a narrow way that leads to life. It's not wide. It's not big. It's very narrow. In fact, he goes on to say, few people find it. In fact, what Jesus said is that Christianity is so narrow that the majority of people do not find the gate that leads to life. The majority of people miss the narrow gate because they're unwilling to go through it because they miss it. They don't go by it. The way that leads to life is extremely narrow narrow. Now, if your view of reality is that there are multiple ways, I run into Christians sometimes that have been, uh, they've been enculturated to believe that Christianity is one of the ways, but not the only way. And my problem that I have with this is that it's what, uh, it's what uh, scholars would say, you can't embrace uh, non-contradiction. When someone says, I embrace Christianity, but I also embrace, say, Hinduism, what they don't understand is that they don't go together, they contradict each other. And so you have to choose, what, am I, what do I believe, which do I believe, because I cannot simply embrace a bunch of ways and believe that a bunch of ways lead to God if, if the Christianity itself defines itself as a narrow way. I want to be very clear about this. Let me say this as clearly as I can. You cannot be a Christian. I'm going to offend some people here. You cannot be a Christian like the Bible defines a Christian and believe that there are multiple ways to reach God. It's exclusive to the doctrine of Christianity. Let me go further. If there were other ways of getting to God, Jesus would have never come. If you could reach God by being good and sincere, Jesus would have never come and died on a cross. If there were ways of higher enlightenment to reach God, and you go from enlightenment to enlightenment by your own power and self-discipline, then Jesus would have never come and died on a cross. If you could reach God through doing good works, as many religions say, and keeping the rules, then Jesus would have never come. To embrace any other way except the cross of Jesus is to deny the salvation of Jesus Christ is to deny Christianity. And if you're going to be a Christian the way the Bible defines Christianity, then Christianity is exclusive. It will be offensive because the way is very narrow. But to be a Christian, to Christian as the Bible defines Christianity, you have to embrace that there is no other way to be right with God except through the cross of Jesus Christ, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As you repent, believe, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, washes you, cleanses 
changes you and makes you right with God. That's the message of the Bible. It's offensive in a pluralistic society. But I want you to know, I don't want you to call yourself a Christian if you're not a Christian. I don't want you to say, I'm a Christian, but I believe there's multiple ways. No, you're not a Christian. You're a pluralist. I don't want you to call yourself a, a believer in Jesus Christ and a follower of Jesus Christ if you deny the very message that Christ is declaring. It was Josh McDowell that said, Jesus was either a liar, a lunatic, or the son of God. You have to decide, was he a liar because he claimed I'm the only way, the truth, and the life? Was he a lunatic that had delusions of grandeur and believed some? Or was he actually the son of God as we believe and say it was? And I could go into a lot of the debate about the reason he was the son of God is that it was verified through the resurrection that was verified through 400 people that saw him, that was verified through disciples that witnessed the resurrection and actually were willing to be boiled alive, crucified upside down, heads chopped off, and I don't know anybody that would do that for a lie when they're tortured. Is that a popular message today? No. Is that an accepted message today? No. Can I tell you, there's no way of trying to tell someone they're wrong in a nice way because ultimately it comes down to being offensive. Have you ever tried to tell someone nicely they were wrong? Seriously, have you tried to do it? I've tried to do it. You know, I understand your intentions. You have a good heart. I could see how you thought that way. It was probably, you know, I, a lot of people make that mistake, but you know, you're wrong. <laughs> and no matter how nice you are about it, no matter how nice you tell someone they're wrong, when it finally boils down to telling someone they're wrong, it is offensive. How many of you know that? The cross of Jesus Christ, the message of the cross, the message of Christianity for 2,000 years has been offensive. It's been offensive because it's, it's, it's exclusive. It's been offensive because it's narrow. It's been offensive because when people get down to what Christianity is saying, it's saying that there's one way to God, and if you don't get on that one way, then you are wrong, and you're going down a way that leads to destruction. But there is one way to God, and it's extremely narrow, Few people find it, it's hard, but there's one way, not multiple options, not A, B, and C, not many ways to God. There is one way to God, and that is offensive in our society. You're saying, well, pastor, Christianity is narrow. Yes, it is. However... Let me say that Christianity is extremely narrow in its message, but extremely inclusive in its love. And I want to define that. And that's my second point, is that yes, Christianity is radically narrow, but I also want to say that Christianity is radically inclusive. Oftentimes, Christians have confused the two. We've been radically exclusive and very wide in our open door. By radically exclusive, I mean that sometimes there's an attitude of religious superiority in which people that are contradictory to Christianity a prostitute that's out on the street, an addict that's struggling with his addiction, a person that's embraced a homosexual lifestyle, a guy that's living with three girlfriends. We have looked at them at times and we have immediately been exclusive of reaching out, of loving, of sharing, of including, of presenting the gospel, of 
letting them know that God loves them more than anything else in the world and reaching out them with this incredible, powerful, supreme love of God. I want you to know that Jesus was called a friend of sinners. The Pharisees didn't like the fact that Jesus hung out with the prostitute that washed his feet, a publican that was rejected by them. People that were considered sinners and worldly and unacceptable, yet Jesus hung out with them. The religious crowd said, how could you? And Jesus stepped right into the midst of it because although the message of the gospel is extremely narrow, listen to me, the Christianity is extremely inclusive of all that would come to Christ. Listen to what, Je listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 and 30. Come to me. Come on. Come to me all. Who? All. You that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus said, come to me all. That's extremely inclusive. Listen to what else Jesus said. John 7, 37 through 38. On the last day and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone say it out loud. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within their being. I believe at times the church has been the opposite. We have been exclusive in who we love. And we have been unclear about the narrow gate. Jesus... When he was on earth, there's a story in, in John chapter 4 in which Jesus goes through a town that his disciples wanted to avoid. It was called Samaria. Now, what you have to know about Samaria is that Samaria was a place in which they were half Jew, but they were half breeds. And so other Jewish people looked down on them because they were half-breeds, and because religiously they did not line up with the rest of the Jews. And so the real Jew would go around Samaria because they didn't want to go through that neighborhood. You know what I love about Jesus is that Jesus goes to that neighborhood. And not, hey, hey, listen, and not only does he go through that neighborhood, but Jesus stops the car, gets out, and talks to those neighbors because he goes through that neighborhood, and he's not afraid of those people that other people stereotype and reject. And Jesus walked into that neighborhood, and he went to a well. It happened to be the middle of the day, about 12 or 1 o'clock noon. Now, here's what you have to know about you know, there was no plumbing in those days. So if you lived in a house, you had to go get your buckets and you had, to, you had to go to a well and you had to lower your bucket all the way down, get water out, take it out, carry the bucket, go back to your home. It was a hard, laborious job. Everybody did it every day. They had to get water to go to their home. I've been to the Middle East. It's extremely hot, 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 hot at noon or one o'clock. Everybody else in the world would do it early in the morning before the sun got really hot or late at night because you don't want to be carrying buckets of water in 110 degrees. The only reason that you would go at the height of the sun at 1 o'clock or 12 o'clock in the afternoon is if you're avoiding people. You ever done that? You ever thought to yourself, when is no one else going to be there? I'm going to show up at that time. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I'm going to go when no one else is there. This woman, not only was she a Samaritan, but she had history. Jesus, being a Jew, was sitting at the well, 
Jewish rabbis were not supposed to, it was looked down upon them to really talk to a woman by themselves, and they normally wouldn't do that. And Jesus is not only talking to a woman, but he's talking to a Samaritan woman. And Jesus, knowing all things like he does, when he saw this woman, he engaged her in conversation. You know who this woman was? She'd been married and divorced five times. Five. Not once, not twice, not three, not four, not five times. Now, if you've been divorced five times, I don't mean to offend you here. <laughs> but if you've been married and divorced five times, man, you have some issues. Because you would probably admit it yourself, you're not easy to get along with. I mean, you've been through one husband, thought it was going to work, kicked him to the curb, got another one, let me get rid of this one. Get, by the fifth one, you're like, hey, I'm going to deal with you with all the four of the rest. If you don't behave, you're out of here. I can hear her moving her head like this and say, you know what, I've dealt with your kind before. I mean, this was a woman with an attitude. This was a woman that was tough, jaded, an attitude. I mean, she was a woman that, hey, she had issues. She has a hard, jaded veneer. She's been through them. And now, in that culture, this is extremely rare, extremely uh, looked on in a bad light. Now she was just living with the guy she was with, didn't even marry him because, hey, I'm not going to marry him. I've already been divorced five times. I'm not even going to go through that. And she, she sits down to talk with Jesus. And here's what I love about Jesus. He doesn't avoid her. He talks to her. He engages her. She's got an attitude. Who are you? And you have water of life. And we believe this. And you believe that. And he looks beyond her head nodding. So you're saying, Pastor, was she Puerto Rican? No, no, she wasn't Puerto Rican. She's a... I'm just, I'm just projecting on her. Don't be offended if you're Puerto Rican. I love Puerto Ricans. She could have been from Chicago. Seriously. And I love the fact that Jesus kind of presses in on her a little bit. And he peels back the layers, even though she's hard, even though she's callous, even though she's rejected. And he doesn't see a woman that should be avoided. He sees a woman with hurt and pain and issues that needs to be loved on and brought to the kingdom to consider there's a narrow gate here, but I'm going to love you to the narrow gate. And he talks to her and he perseveres and he deals with her attitude until she leaves having sensed that he is the Messiah and she leaves the water well telling everybody, I've met the Messiah. I've met the Messiah. Come, come hear him. I met the Messiah. And here's what I want you to know. Yeah, Christianity is narrow. But listen, it's narrow, but we don't reject. We're not exclusive. We're not condemning. We don't push people away. It's narrow, but the prostitute is welcome. The addict is welcome. The cynic is welcome. The broken is welcome because it is inclusive to everybody. Everybody that has breath within their being. The love of God draws them to himself. The message is, it's narrow. The message is hard. But the love and grace of God is inclusive and broad and overwhelming. And sometimes I believe the churches, we've had it wrong. Our message is unclear, but our exclusivity is biased. There's something ir irresistible about people that have generous, compassionate, compelling love, but are uncompromising about their message. There's something powerful. Listen, you lose the narrow gate, you lose the power to change people's lives. Can I tell you what I see across America? I've seen across America churches that feel like the message of Jesus is so narrow, so they've widened the gate. You don't hear talk about repentance, surrender. 
clear gospel. They've lightened it, sprinkled it, pulled the gate wider, tried to make it easier, lowered the bar, wanting to make it acceptable. And what they've reaped is religious people with no transformation. Light religion without consecration. People that can sing hymns, but there's no change in their Monday through Friday. Because if you widen the gate, you have no new birth. You have no regeneration. You have no Holy Spirit inside of you. You have religious people, but they're not consecrated, committed. They haven't been changed from the inside out. There's no passion or worship or consecration because that only comes by a touch of God that comes as we go through that narrow gate and have to surrender things in our life to say, Jesus, you are Lord, and I have to die to myself as I say yes to you so that I can be born again and experience new life. I'm not talking about religious people. I'm talking about born again people that have been transformed from the inside out. God forbid that we fill churches with people that are religious but haven't experienced a new birth in Christ. Jesus, his message was narrow, but his love was compellingly, compellingly, compellingly inclusive. Romans chapter 10, verse 11 through 13. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Who? For there is no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Verse 13, for everyone, who? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, what I want you to understand, I want to be clear about this. There is no excuse for you to be a believer that's narrow-minded but wide in your gospel message. That makes you a religious bigot. If you're judgmental from the outside, if we're not loving the prostitute, And we're not loving that person that's different from us. And we're not full of compassion and heart and reaching out for the least of these and the marginalized and the broken and those who raise their fist at Christianity and are antagonistic against Christianity. If we're not loving them, if we're not loving them like Jesus did, then we're missing the mark. We need to be narrow in our message but inclusive in our love so that no one can ever come amongst us and say, wow, how those people love. I may disagree with their message, but I can't argue with their powerful, compelling love. See, the power of our message, Jesus said, you will know them by their love. The attitude of us being believers is that we love. We love those that reject us. We love those that are different than us. We love those that have a different religion than us. We love those that think that we're crazy religious zealots. We still love them. We love those that are broken and addicted and in there. We love them anyways because we don't view them as wicked people to be rejected, but as broken people to be reached out to by the incredible love of God, bringing them to the narrow gate and saying, hey, there is a Jesus that can save you, love you, wash you, change you, just like he did to us. When we were broken and rejected, And needed a savior to heal us and cleanse us. Is Christianity narrow? Yes, it is. But is the love of God inclusive? Yes, it is. May we be known by the clarity of our message, but by the depth of our love. And as I said at the beginning, truth is narrow, but grace is wide.